Got some people still trickling in the front door, I see. Thankful for no freezing rain yet this morning, but it's coming. <laughs> uh, would you stand with us as we start this service, please? We're going to sing a song together. Glad you're here with us. For those of you online, good to see you too. Uh, let me just uh, start us with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, for the chance to be together. Thank you for safe travels. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to lift our voices in worship to you. God, you are so worth it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
say hello to the people standing around here. Well, what, here. Good morning, KCC. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, thank you. We are glad you're here. We are glad to see people walking in the door even now. This is good. And we are glad that you're online. If you're out there, especially if you're a visitor, we want to say hi to you and make sure that you say hi to us so that we can get to know you a little bit. So please, if you're online and you're a visitor today, uh, this is a new series, so you might be joining us today for the first time, and we're glad you're here. Please say something so that we can get in contact with you this week and get to know you. For those of you who are here, we're glad you're here. It's, uh, iffy weather out there and so when you make the decision to come here it's a big decision and it means a lot so thank you for doing that today we do start a new series it's a series called what on earth am i here for it's actually a re re uh, released book all right it's a re-released book uh, from The Purpose Driven Life. Rick Warren wrote it, and we're kind of using that book as a jump-off point for the next series. This is the time, actually, we're going to do small groups for this series. This is a short-term small group. Today is the last day to sign up for those groups because they actually launch after the... Some of them are actually launching today. Some of them will be going throughout the week. So if you haven't signed up for a group yet, it's not too late but it's pretty close to too late. So we would love for you to do that, especially if you've never been in a small group before. This is a perfect way to try it. It's a short-term thing. You're in it for six weeks, and then you can make a decision whether you want to do, a, do it again or, or whatever. But this is a great way to do that, great way to get to know some other KCCers and help them to grow in their faith, join them in prayer, that kind of thing. There's a lot of fellowship that can happen. It's a really good time, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, again, there's a table out there in the lobby. This is the last day that you can sign up for these things, okay? Uh, we have a new thing coming up uh, in February. February 12th, we have an event coming up. It's our marriage, uh, marriage date night, I believe. Yes, we have marriage to the fullest date night. We have a speaker, a couple coming in um, that are going to make a presentation that night. We have EMA catering, which is if you've ever had their catering at graduation open houses or whatever, it's good food. We have, we have some uh, some interesting things lined up that will be fun and funny. And so we encourage you to do that. KCC is part of this. The Waymaker team is part of this. We're hosting it here at KCC. And KCC people get a discount. If you just, when you go online to register, and we'll talk a lot about this next week, we'll give you all the information. When you go online to register, you can click on the discount code, just use KCC, and you get, it's in, normally it might be $75 for the couple, for you it's only 60. So this is a good thing to do, and we really want to encourage all married couples to do this. Whether you're young or you're old, this is all about sort of don't settle for ordinary in your marriage. This is, how, how can you make it better? How can God show up in your marriage even more than he already has? And so this would be a great thing for you to get in on. And so please put that on your calendar, February 12th. You'll hear more about it next week and get all the details next week. But you can register online even today. We'll put that on our Facebook page and you can follow that link. So that's an exciting thing that we're looking forward to. Um, this is also the time in our service now. If you haven't yet and you want to, you can give online. You can give, there's a box back there that you can give in if you're here live. Uh, many of you have given faithfully over this time of the pandemic and you don't even think about it anymore. It just kind of comes out automatically. But we never want to take for granted the fact that God has met our needs individually. God meets our needs as a church and we don't want to sort of gloss over that fact. So I'm going to pray right now if you would join me in doing that. Father, we thank you that you are the source of all blessing. You are the source of every good thing. And we thank you that you have been good to us as families. You've been good to us individually. You've been good to us as a church. And we thank you that your people have generously provided for the ministries of our church. And I pray that you would help us as leaders in the church to use those funds well to use them for your glory, to use them for further impact and further outreach. And we commit this whole service to you, and we commit this time and this church to you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you can, get on your feet with us one more time. Let's sing this song. It's called My Testimony. Because of what Christ did for us, we're no longer dead, we are alive. First one. Oh, I saw Satan fall like lightning. 
And I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Sing, I believe I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power But still the miracle that so glad for the truth of that song. I'm so glad that Grace re rewrote my story. Aren't you? I am glad that he's not done. If I'm not dead, he's not done. He's still working, and there's a lot more work to do. If, if, uh, if you know me, there's a lot of work to do still on me, and I'm sure that's true for all of us. We can all say that. God is still at work, and that's a beautiful, good thing. He does not stop working on us. And, and today, as we start this new series, that's one of the things we want to do is to be willing to say, Lord, continue your work on me. We need it. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about today is how, how often we get into a mindset where we just go through, you know, from, for a church, we just go from one series to the next series to the next series, one month to the next month to the next month. And if we're not careful... You know, a, a, six months goes by, a year goes by, and really, I mean, we've done church, but we haven't grown. 
It's, it's possible to do church and not to grow at all. I don't want that. Do you? I mean, I want our, our church to be full of people who are growing and, and going further with the Lord and, and getting more intimately connected with God and letting him do things in his life, in their lives, that, that only he can do. That's, don't, don't allow yourself to get into the rut of just saying, well, I did church today. Nobody needs that. We need him to show up. We need him to do things in our lives. So, so make sure that you're praying as you enter into this new series, whether you're going to do a small group or not, as you enter into this series, ask God to do something in your life. Ask him to get a hold of your heart. If maybe, maybe you realize your heart hasn't been all that passionate for him lately. It's just been going through the motions. It, it isn't like you don't believe, but you've just been sort of going through the motions. Don't let that be your new normal. Ask God to do something in you that only he can do. The Holy Spirit can revive you. He can. He wants to. And so as we start this new series, man, I just, I hope and pray, that's been my prayer, that God would use this to just revive us individually and as a church. And I hope that you experience that yourself. So, as we start this new series, let me start with this statement that's going to be fleshed out in the next several weeks. You have a purpose. You are here by design, by the Creator, and He has things that He wants to do in you and through you. And that's an important distinction. Because think about it. If we don't have a purpose, if we're just here, we're just sort of biologically complex beings that live for however long, but we have no purpose, then we're just sort of bumping into things as we go and trying to find our way, and there's no direction, and there's no meaning, and then we die. If that's all there is, man, what a bummer would that be? But if, if God actually does have a purpose for you, then it's important that, number one, we know that, and number two, that we figure out what it is. And that then we can, as a result, we can share that with other people. So today, as we get into this series, hopefully you will understand how significant that is and how different it is from some people and, and the way they live. A lot of people don't realize they have a purpose. They don't connect it to the Lord, and so they just sort of meander through their day, and they don't know what to do. They don't really know what they're living for. And that can be a really hopeless, empty kind of existence. And so we want to we change that. Um, now, this is January. Obviously, in January, if you're a sports fan, you know that there's several things going on in the sports world that uh, are pretty significant. Tomorrow night, in fact, is the NCAA championship, football championship, and the Alabama Crimson Tide, Braxton Luster, are, are, are going to go at, against the Georgia Bulldogs, and most of the country, I hope, is thinking Georgia hope, hopefully is going to win because Alabama wins all the time, Braxton. But... Um, <laughs> Because, but somebody will be crowned a champion tomorrow, and they will feel like, man, they've accomplished a lot. They've been going after this, and they've accomplished a lot. The, the NFL playoffs are going to start soon, and there's one team, at least I know, that won't be involved. And so my Sunday, even, Sunday afternoons will be quite nice. It'll be like, I, I, don't, I can watch if I want to, but I don't really have to, and I don't feel all that compelled to watch it, but by the middle of February, there will be a Super Bowl champion, and for many of those athletes, that's the culmination of their entire career. All of a sudden, they're an NFL Super Bowl champion, trademark, and, and so they will, they will then uh, be able to say that for the rest of their lives, that I, my team won the Super Bowl. Around that same time, the Olympics will begin in Beijing, China, and it will start, and we will be cheering on people who will who will do amazing things. We'll, we'll watch them do these amazing routines, amazing ski jumps and everything, and they will, be, they will be Olympic champions. And their whole lives have been geared toward this. They've been practicing almost from the time they could walk, some of them. They've been practicing and getting up early and staying up late and going to tournaments and comp competing and have won and won, you know, they've won m numerous, numerous times to get to that point. And it'll be, you know, they'll be in the spotlight and they'll be doing their thing. And I can't help but wonder, every, every once in a while you see this, when you're Olympics, I mean, this is the culmination of everything you've been after, everything you've sacrificed for and dreamed about. And here you are, it's your moment in the spotlight. 
And if you put two feet down instead of one at a certain landing, you've just lost. Or if you're a hundredth of a second behind the next speed skater, you're lost. Or if you are that famous ski jumper coming down, just getting ready to jump, and he slips and falls, and he injures himself, and he injures spectators, and it's the agony of defeat. And that's what you're known by from that point forward. How tough, how terrible would that be? If all I've been given for, all I've been going for, all I've been dedicating myself to is now a fraction slower than I needed to be. And so I don't get a medal. I don't get a podium spot. There's no national anthem played for me. I don't get a Wheaties box picture. <laughs> Nothing. All of a sudden, boom, it's just done. How terrible would that be if that's, what you, that's your whole purpose? And yet I also think for those who win those things, it might be a little bit easier without a doubt, but, but I wonder if I won it, okay, now I've got it, what's next? Is this all there is? I've achieved what I wanted to. Is this it? Do I need to try again? Do I need to be a repeat performer like Michael Phelps in the Summer Olympics so that I can just keep getting more medals? And eventually, everybody will have to acknowledge that I was the best one ever. Is that then my goal? And then what? Now I've got the rest of my life to live. And then what? See, the thing is, if we don't have, if we don't have a vision or a meaning or a, or a goal, then we just flounder. There, you know, the athletes are not alone. I think the other day there, was, there were two people in the United States who won the Powerball jackpot, one in California, one in Wisconsin. They have to share $632 million. I hope they can find a way to do that. They have to share all of this money. And yet we've heard many stories, read many stories of people who win the lotto, and you would think everything's better. They have, they have no more debt. They, have, they can do whatever it is they want. They don't have to work anymore. They can go where they want to do, wherever they want to go. They can do whatever it is they want to do. They can buy whatever it is they want to buy. And yet within five years, many times, their lives are a complete mess. They've lost their job. They've lost their money. They're bankrupt. They've lost their family. They've, they're destroyed. Why is that? Because if there isn't something giving your life purpose, something driving your life, something that you are after, something that is controlling you and showing you how to move forward. If there isn't something, in other words, that's giving you a vision and a purpose, then you will just flounder. And that's not what we're made to be like. We are made with a purpose. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Another version says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. In both cases, what it's saying is, if God isn't involved in giving you the purpose and giving you direction, if he's not the one steering your life, it's going to be a mess. Your life is going to be a mess. It's just because you're, you're made to be driven by and steered by and, and oriented by God. And so today I want to talk to you about three whys and two whats, okay? So you can keep track. And you can think, okay, is he still on number one? <laughs> Three whys and two whats. I want you to keep track. First of all, first why is why do you exist? Why do you exist? A lot of times it depends on who you ask. Why do I exist? Depends on who you ask. One of the things I'm going to talk about today is worldviews. A worldview is a grid. It's a, it's a philosophical grid. All of us have a worldview through which we interpret everything that happens in the world. It's a, it's a way of understanding things, a way of understanding life. And everybody has a worldview. M most people don't think about their worldview. They just go through the life and react. But everybody has a worldview. I'll illustrate it this way. It, for today's uh, discussion, there's two different worldviews. One is a self-focused worldview. The other is a God-focused worldview for our purposes today, okay? There's two worldviews. You're one or the other, always. Everybody falls into one or the other, a self-focused worldview or a God-focused worldview, okay? If you focus on a self-focused worldview, you are all about yourself. You're all about your own mission, your own purpose, your own, uh, your own belonging, your own sense of who you are, your own sense of, of what I want, your goals, your purposes, your desires, etc. cetera. And, and this has been, of course, become more and more popular over the last 50 years in particular. There was a guy, a, a psychologist named Abraham Maslow back in the 40s, actually. He wrote something called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, this, this picture here. This is, this is sort of the understanding of your hierarchy of how you go through life, the things you're after, okay? So the bottom line is you first have to have your physiological needs met, your, your 
food and clothing and shelter and water and those kinds of things. And then you can go on up, but you get, hopefully, you get to the point, the very tip top, where you get to self-actualization. That's you becoming the best you you can be, okay? His point was that you can't expect people to be self-actualized if they don't have all these other things met too. And I mean, I get that to a certain extent. If I wonder where my next meal is going to come from, then having some philosophical discussion with me is probably not, not something I'm all that interested in. And yet, when I go to meet people in Guatemala, or when I, I, I go to Uganda, and I see my friends there who have a mud hut, and they wear one outfit all the time. And if they have shoes, they're beat up shoes. And they don't know where their food is going to come from or their water is going to come from. And yet they have joy and they have peace and they have contentment like nobody in, West, in the Western world has. How is that possible if this is absolutely true? How is that possible? How is it that they can know who they are, know who God has made them to be, live with an eternal purpose that changes everything, changes their perspective on everything, if this is absolutely true? I think this is wrong. And I think, in, in that respect, this is wrong. And I think much of our culture of self has grown up out of this kind of thinking. And for the last 50 years, it's been all about self-esteem and self-love and self-image and self-care. Self, 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 self is everywhere. And if it worked, our culture would probably be a lot healthier than it is right now. It doesn't work. Because it misses the most important thing. It misses God. It misses the eternal purpose that God has created you for. If we start with self, we will end with self. If we start with God, everything else falls into place. Genesis 1.1, at the very beginning, the first words of the first verse of the first chapter of the book of the Bible, in the beginning, God. What that means is God was there before everything else. God was there before matter. God was there before space. God was there before time. God was there before human life or any other kind of life. God was there before any of it. That's why it's important that he knows that he gives purpose to all of it. Without God, none of the rest of it exists, period. And for the rest of us to go through life as if the first the one who was there from before all of it and created all of it as if he doesn't exist doesn't make any sense. It will not go well if we do that. If you don't start with God, everything else up, ends up wrong. Let me say that again. If you don't start with God, everything else ends up wrong. And many people in our lives today don't start with God. Maybe they, they include him at some point, but they don't start and are driven by the Lord. Ecclesiastes 3.11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. See, man is unique in this. Man has been given the image of God. He has been created in the image of God. Nobody else, no other created being thinks about this stuff. You and I are here today because we think differently than anything else. Your cat does not contemplate the meaning of the universe. A wombat does not contemplate whether there's a creator. Even as intelligent an animal as a dolphin or a dog doesn't contemplate what happens after I die. They don't think that way. We do. Why? Because God has placed eternity in your heart. God has made you so that you ask these questions. That's how we are designed. And the reason he did that is so that we would seek him, the creator. And so if we don't start with God, everything else ends up wrong. We all have this, but we try to fill it with other things. We have this, this hole inside of us that can only be filled with God, but we try to fill it with other stuff, even in the church. And that is the message, people, that this series needs to remind you of. That even though you are a believer, I assume you're a believer if you're here today, or you're at least investigating this faith thing, and you're interested in it, that's why you're here today. But even though you've taken that step, we oftentimes just get confused and we get distracted and we get, we get filled up with other things that sidetrack us from our ultimate purpose. Remember Psalm 139, we've talked about it before. Verses 13 through 16, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. God created you. God put you together. You, personally. God put you together. And that's crucial that you understand that if you are going to figure out your purpose, it has to start with your creator. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, this is kind of where we're taking this series from. It's kind of revamped to this, this current, you know, uh, what, what, am I, what on earth am I here for? It's kind of a revamped, purpose-driven life. He wrote that book back in 2002 in the midst of all of the self-esteem kind of thing. And he wrote it, and he started it with this sentence that his publishers had to be saying, you can't do that. You can't start a book in this day and age with this sentence. It's a four-word four sentence. It's not about you. That's the way he started this book. It's not about you. It's like, pfft. Here's a right hook right to your jaw to begin the book. And the publishers, I'm assuming, had to be like, what are you doing? I mean, I know you're, you know, you're a popular author, but what are you doing? That's not how you start. That's not how you win friends and influence people. The book has sold over 50 million copies in 85 different languages, and now it's being re-released with some new material because a whole new generation is looking for their purpose. We're all looking for our purpose. It's one of the things we do. We want to know why we exist. We want to know how things work. And that's a pretty amazing thing. But one of the things he says in this book is you are not an accident. You may have been an accident in your parents' eyes. <laughs> they may not have been planning on you, but God was, you're not an accident in God's eyes. Every individual person was created by the Lord. So even though your parents may have not, not have been planning you, you were created by God. I am the 10th of 13 kids. No rational person plans 10 or 13 kids, right? <laughs> My parents would agree with that, right? They, what did they do? They said, okay, God, you are going to give us what, we, what you want us to have. And so we're not going to stop you. And that's why they had 13 kids. And I'm very glad they did because, again, if they, didn't, if they were approached it the way most other people would, I would not be here, and you would all be staring at an empty stage wondering, what, okay, what's going on now, right? I wouldn't even be here. I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad they went with what God said. But the point is, even if they didn't plan every one of us, God did. We have six kids. We didn't plan them all. God did. You may, I don't know what your background was. I don't know what your circumstances of conception were, but I do know this. Every individual was planned by God, created by God, important to God. That's an important distinction that when we know, when we start with God, that gives meaning to every individual's life, no matter who they are, no matter what the circumstances of their birth. It makes a big difference. So point number two, wh why number two? Why did God make you? Again, if it's not about you, why did he make you? He made you, number one, to love you. He made you so that he can love you. God is, as 1 John 4, 8, 18 says, God is love. That's who he is. It's not just what he does. It's not that he has extra love so he gives some to us. That's his character. That's his essence. He is love. And he wanted to create beings that he could love and that could understand his love. It wasn't because he was lonely. But God created you to love you. He wants to love you. And he wants you to experience that. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5 says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. It gives God pleasure to love you, to help you to experience his love. That's one of the reasons. He made you so that he could love you and so that you could understand his love. You could then bask in his love. And ultimately, he made you so that you could love him back. That's the second reason. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. It's one of the basic commandments. It's the number one commandment, Jesus said. It actually comes, he, he refers back to Deuteronomy and Exodus where this is, this is first started. Love God with everything you've got. So the way this works is the God who created you 
loves you and wants you to experience that love. And as you experience that love, you will want to give it back. It's the natural thing to do. As you are loved by the perfect creator, you want to love him back. Nothing else works. Nothing else works. It wasn't designed to. We distract ourselves with a lot of other pursuits and a lot of other passions. There's a book um, that was written called Practical Atheist. And basically, with that Practical Atheist books, what, what it does is it challenges people who are faith-filled people, people who say they're in the faith. We say we believe, but we live as though we don't. We say we believe, but we live as though the world has the wisdom for us. The world, our culture has what we need. We say we believe, but we don't live as though God is real and God is directing us and God is our source and God is our creator. So why did God make you? He made you to love you and he made you so that you can love him back. Third why. Why does it matter? Why does it even matter? Why is this stuff important? I mean, there's probably people in this room who are thinking, oh, I could have stayed home today. I don't really need this. I know all this stuff. Maybe you do, but do you live that way? Why does it matter? Because there's a whole bunch of people. I mean, you know a bunch of them who don't know this or don't live this way. And as a result, they're just kind of meandering through life, b bouncing off of one wall, hitting the next wall, hoping that they don't injure themselves by their bumping into these things too much because they're trying to find their purpose. They're trying to find their direction. And you and I know it. And we need to share it with them. Why does it matter? Because if we, if we live as though God does not exist, it does not go well. Henry David Thoreau was a poet and author. He wrote Walden. He wrote this book about, about this, this ultimate uh, place that man would make and everybody, everything would go well. Everybody would share equally. Everybody would contribute equally. Everybody would, would rule equally. All these, it would be this this ultimate uh, beautiful place. And it, of course, can't work because people aren't that good. We have a nature within us that is selfish. And if there isn't something like the Lord to change that, it will not work. He wrote this. He wrote, the mass of men, all of man, leads lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is actually confirmed desperation. And from the desperate city, you go into the desperate country, and you have to console yourselves with the bravery of minks and muskrats. A stereotyped unconscious despair is concealed under even what we are called the games and amusements of mankind. What he's saying there is everybody is desperate and looking for something, looking for meaning, looking for direction. Everybody is looking for their purpose. And yet, most of us just don't find it. And so what do we do? We get desperate. And so we leave our city life where we're working and doing, and doing all that stuff, and we go out into the country. We think in nature we're going to find it. And basically, we have to watch the, the minks and the muskrats fight for survival, and that's where we get inspired from. And if we don't find it from them, we make it in our amusements, in our epic movies that I like so much, or in our, our Call of Duty computer games or something like that. We, we, we try to infuse ourselves with this kind of purpose when really the purpose, he doesn't say this, the purpose is from God. So when we live as though God does not exist or live as though our purpose doesn't come from him, we live lives of quiet desperation. And I would say this, most of the people that you know are living lives of quiet desperation and they're filling it with something. They're trying to fill it frantically with something. Something's got to work and you know what works. If we live as though God does exist, like Augustine said, we, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Blaise Pascal, who was a mathematician and philosopher, he actually, his math drove him to faith in God. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus. There's a God-shaped hole within you. C.S. Lewis wrote, the more we let God make us over, the more truly ourselves we become because God made us. He invented us. He invented all the different people that you and I were intended to be. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give up myself to his personality, that I first begin to have real personality of my own. In other words, you can't be who you were created to be unless you turn to God and unless you turn to him through Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden you start to, life starts to make sense. So if you're looking for your purpose, 
You will not find it unless you find it in the Lord. It matters. God does exist, and starting with him is crucial to living out your purpose. And so I said three, three whys, here's two whats. What am I here for? What am I here to do? Obviously, there are worldly alternatives. We can all do these things, and, and we do. Materialism is one of them. If you have stuff, you need more stuff. You always need more stuff. And, of course, that's what makes our economy go around. So, yeah, we'll try to convince you you need more stuff. I got a new car. Good. You need a better one. I got a big house. Great. You need a bigger one. I got a boat. Good. You need a bigger one. You need a jet. You need, a, you know, you need something more all the time. Maybe, okay, well, I don't think about jets or, or boats or whatever, but maybe for you it's just, you know, I got a new fridge. I need a new one. I got a better TV. I need a bigger TV. I talk about that with my wife all the time. She kind of looks at me like, I don't think so. I need a bigger TV because it exists. Therefore, I need it. Right? We can, materialism is one of those things that we fill it with. Success. For some of you, it's success in your career. You're on your way up the ladder, and you just need to keep going. If you find the end of this, uh, the highest you can go in this company, you need to find another company so that you can go higher. Success becomes one of the things you live for. Popularity, just wanting to be liked all the time. In this day and age with Instagram and Facebook and all of that, that's a big one. You know, I did something the other day. I have an Instagram account. Any, any of you adults have an Instagram account? Okay, not very many of you. <laughs> I have an Instagram account that once in a while I put a picture. I did something new the other day. I made a reel. Now, all of you younger people are just rolling your eyes at me because I think this is a big deal. I made a reel, and I put music to it, and it was awesome. And it got more than 100 likes in, like, no time at all from a whole bunch of people I didn't know. And I thought, wow, I need to make another one. I need to go for 200. <laughs> Right? And it, it is addictive. If you, if you live for that, it is easy to be. And then you're like, man, that thing only got five likes. I failed. What's, what am I worth? And you can see how easy it could become to be consumed with this stuff if popularity is what you're living for. Educational achievement is what some people live for. You graduated high school, cool. You got a bachelor's degree, great. Now you need a master's degree. If you got a master's degree, you need a PhD. If you have a PhD, you need another one. You need to teach somewhere. You need to do these kinds of things. Why? Because ec educational achievement is your thing. For some of us, for more and more of us, the thing we're living for, the thing that guides us, is comfort and safety more and more. If I could figure out a way where I could stay in my home and have everything come to me and not have to enter the world where disease is or the world where accidents happen on the roads, man, I'm going to do it. I'm going to isolate myself. I, that would be great. No, no, it won't. That's not what you're made for. God-centered alternatives are what you're made for, what you exist here for. Rick Warren says, without God, life has no purpose. Without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance and no hope. And without hope, well, you know, without hope, we give up. Without hope, we stop trying to push through. But with God, everything changes. Knowing your purpose, which is to know him and to love him, means give, it gives meaning to your life. Knowing your purpose simplifies your life. It allows you to say yes to these things and no to all of these distractions. Knowing him motivates your life. It gives you a goal. Knowing him prepares you for eternity. So knowing him, finding your fulfillment in him, serving him, sharing him, these are your keys to individual purpose. And if you can start with that, everything else will fall into place. And nothing else will, over, will control you too much because you've got your purpose in the right place. Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5 says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you, Jeremiah, as a prophet to the nations. Why did I bring this up? Not because you have the same calling as Jeremiah. You don't. But you have a calling. Before God even formed him, he knew what he was going to do with him. God knew you before you were created. God knows what he wants to do in your life and through your life. So start with him, and everything else will make sense. So what are you here for? You're here to know and love and serve God, to glorify him by following his lead. That's your purpose. Your final what. So what do we do with this? Remember this. God is eternal, and so are you. Everybody will live in eternity. Some will live with God, and some will reject him in the way that he gave to live with him. 
We need to be focused on eternity and living it now. Jesus said in John 3, 16 and 17, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, no, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is yours through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Romans 3, 23 and 23, 23 and 24, there is a problem. All have sinned. All have fallen short of God's glorious standard but are justified freely by his grace that comes through us through Jesus Christ. Christ. It is through that relationship with Jesus Christ that we can have our, our lives changed, our eternity changed, our, our, our direction changed. We need to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if you haven't done that, that's where it needs to start. And so if you haven't done that and you're out there or you're here, you need to ask somebody, somebody who invited you, somebody who, who shared this on Facebook and that's why you tuned in, somebody who who is here? You can certainly ask me if you're here. How do I know this? How do I know this life that you're talking about, this eternal life? How can I be sure? Don't let that go because that's step number one. But even after we know him, we need to keep our minds focused on eternity. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Hebrews 13, 14 says, For this world is not our permanent home. We're, not, we're looking forward to a home yet to come. This world is not your permanent home. This is not not your eternal home. Heaven is with God. So don't live as though this is. Don't live according to the standards of this world. Don't derive your value from this world. Don't let this world and its chaotic mess give you your purpose. God gives you your purpose. Start there. Refocus there. Bring it back to him and he will begin to change your life as you follow that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come and we thank you, Lord, that you give us purpose. You created us, Lord. As, as mind-blowing as that, that is to think of, you created us and you knew us before you even brought us into existence. Lord, we know that everything starts with you. Our purpose starts with you. Our meaning starts with you. And Lord, we confess that there are times we get confused. We get distracted. We get drawn away by other things. Help us, Lord, to get back to you. Help us to focus on you, to let you drive us and give us the purpose. Help us to love you as we are loved by you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, one more time, please stand with us as we sing. This is a song about how, uh, how we do find ourselves identified by Christ, by the, the redemption that he has offered us, by the rescue that comes only in his name. Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry?
That glorious day is what he is calling us to live in, to live it out and to share it with people. So now that you can focus again on what your purpose is, share it with people. They need it. You have it. Share it. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us of everything you've created us for. Thank you for remembering that we've, we've been called out of that grave. We have given new, we've been given new life through Jesus Christ. Help us to share it, Lord, in everything we say, everything we do, the way we live, all our relationships. Help us to live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.